up here for a second. Actually, I'll do the code here. Put this here. It just helps me organize later. That way I can look at it and know right away what, what class it is. Okay, so this is the basic Hello World program. And like I mentioned last week, most of this we can ignore. Right now we're just concentrating the stuff inside of uh, main. So right now actually only line seven. You don't even have to worry about line nine right now. So for all of our programs, every other line is gonna be the same. You're always gonna have the include, the using namespace, all this other stuff. All that's gonna change is the stuff over here inside of main. And each one of our lines of code runs from here to the semicolon. So when I say line of code, this is what I mean. And the semicolon means the end of the line of code. The reason we do semicolons is because sometimes we actually want to split up our lines of code over multiple lines. So I can do something like this. The reason it still works and it runs correctly is because it reads from here all the way up to the semicolon. Just make sure it's streaming. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so that's why I have that. And does anybody remember what the end line, or oh, sorry, oh, I gave you the answer. So the end L is short for end line. It's imagine if you're on a typewriter and you hit the return key, it gives you a new line. So if we wrote this, oops, that's not good. again here so if I wrote another line of code see out hello again and by the way the structure of the course remember is that I type code and then unless I tell you not to you type the code there will be times where I'm like breaking something purposefully and, and I'll give you a warning ahead of time, but for the most part, you're you're going to be typing the any code that I type. Now we did some experimenting with some basic things. Remember, I got rid of the end L. What happens if I get rid of this? Remember, it it, it occurs in pairs. So we have, it, when we're working with these, we have to do the the arrows plus the end L. The string plus the arrows, we'll get into that in a minute. What do you think happens if I get rid of it? It'll print them both on the same line. Exactly. It'll print both things on the same line because it's 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 basically like we never hit the enter key or the return key. Okay, so we get that. Now what do you think happens if I do two of them? What'll happen? Put a space in between them. Exactly, yeah, we have an extra space between them. I shouldn't say space, an extra line. line. Yeah. Now, these, uh, this thing right here in the double quotes, remember this was called a string. It's a string of characters. And you can think of it kind of as like a, a just a blob of, of, it could be letters, numbers, spaces, underscores, any, any character, even if you can't necessarily see the character, like a space or a tab, you can't even really see that um, if it's between these double quotes, okay? Now, let's do this. And L. So the two data types that we're going to be working with, very broadly, we're going to get into some more details, but very broadly, we're going to be dealing with strings, and I just described strings, and numbers. Now this may get a little bit confusing for some people because I can actually represent a number as a string, right? Everyone sees that here? So this is the string seven, but if I don't have the double quotes around it, I have the number seven. By the way, one of the nice things about these IDEs is they give us what's called syntax highlighting. And you'll notice that on line number 10. Do you notice the difference that this is green, this is red? So this editor in particular, every editor is a little bit different, but they'll give you some sort of visual cue 
that, hey, you're dealing with a string. Here we're, we're dealing with a number. And then we run this, same exact output, but so an exercise I like to do a lot is um, write code, but don't necessarily run this. So don't run this just yet. I want everyone to take about 10 seconds. So, so write it out and look at it and what um, kind of think to yourself what the output will be. So don't say it. I want to get everyone a chance to think about it, but just think to yourself for a, for a second. Okay, so without running it, what do you think 9 and 10 will output? Yes. Exactly. So th this one will output the string, the actual thing, 7 plus 2. This, because we, ha we don't have the quotes around it, this will interpret it as C++ code. It turns out that valid C++ code, we can just do, we can almost treat it like a simple calculator. Remember we talked about last time, the whole purpose of computers and programming languages during the first iteration, like the Cold War, World War II era computers, they were basically just very fancy calculators. And so these basic calculations are essentially built into the language. We can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We can do all these basic arithmetic operations inside of the language itself. So let's run that just to confirm. Okay, and we, we get the output. So we can do that. We can do subtraction. Multiplication, and I don't want to get into division just yet. Division is a little bit tricky. Now, this is a very common mistake. It won't come up in this course very much, but I just want to tell you right now because it is something I see very often. That you're like, oh, that's, if I've got like a Texas Instruments calculator, that looks like their notation that they use. So if I wanted to do 7 squared, I could do something like this. And it turns out you can't. This is what's called a bitwise operation. It has nothing to do with anything with arithmetic at all. Okay. If you want to do seven squared, there's a. We'll get into that later. How to do that? You have to. You have to call something called a function, which we're we're not ready to talk about just yet. So it is possible. It's just not the way you you, you wouldn't do it the way you would think, um, kind of naturally. And then remember we talked about this thing. What was when we when we do those two slashes? Does anybody remember what that's called? Comment. A comment. And the way a comment works is it's either for um, adding notes for yourself, or sometimes if you have a piece of code that you don't want to run, just temporarily. Like if you're trying to fix something and it's like some, it's like this code's acting up or doing something that's weird. It's very common that you'll comment out a piece of code. So right now you see the last line would be 14, but if we comment out the code it won't run. And the way a comment works is it's valid from the start of the comment all the way to the end of the line. Okay, so that's essentially just a review of last week. Any any questions before we move on to new stuff? I apologize, I have to move a little quickly because of our, um, we have a more constrained lecture. So, but I don't wanna move so fast that I lose people. So is everyone everyone good so far? Okay, and if at any time I'm just going way too fast, just let me know, because if I'm moving too fast for you, I'm probably moving fast too fast for other people as well, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and open up another REPL tab here. So go to Blackboard, click C++ REPL. And it might get annoying, but I always like to start these from scratch. The reason being is that you just get used to typing these funny characters in some of this code, so. I think it's always good to start from scratch. And then one of the things I like to do is just see out, maybe this is gonna be the second example, EX2, and then run it before I run any other code. Because what'll happen sometimes is that maybe REPL's having problems, maybe you mistyped something. And so if you, if you go right into writing a very long program, what might happen is 
that there's a mistake somewhere or there's a problem and then you'll just waste a bunch of time this is kind of like a sanity check. Can I at least run the most basic program? This, you know, we call it the Hello World program. Can I at least run that much? If if I can't even run this much, adding code isn't going to help anything. You know, so this is. I always start with this for all all the examples. And you know, ninety nine percent of the time it's going to work fine. But that one percent, and I've been in situations like that where I thought I was doing something and I should have just started fresh from the basics and built my way up. But I tried to do too much at once. And it turned out there was a problem all the way back at step number one. And you can very quickly waste an hour that way. So do things very layer by layer by layer, build up, make sure things work, and so on. OK, so what I want to do is introduce the concept of variables. OK, and so a variable, um, you might think, oh, OK, variable. I know that from like my algebra classes. It's kind of the same, but it's different enough that I want you to clear your mind of that concept. It's the same in that it holds a value and that value can change, but that's about as far as it goes. And there's a lot of other things where it's not the same. And you'll try to treat it like a variable for an algebra and it won't work that way and it'll be very confusing. Okay, so let's do this. I like to just dive right into code. So when we work with a variable, we have to declare the variable and, and say that we're going to have this variable okay so let's say for example so i'm going to put a comment here that says this is how we declare a variable And the way we do that is first we say the data type. So the basic data types that we're going to work with pretty much almost all throughout the course. There are many other data types, but these are the ones that we're going to focus on, okay? Int, double, and string. So int is short for integer. An integer is going to be a positive or negative whole number. So 9, 14, 3,000, 0, negative 80. Would 2.5 be an integer, yes or no? No, why not? It's got a decimal point, so it's a float. Exactly, it's not a whole number. So that's an integer, positive and negative whole numbers. And some of you may know this from like math, maybe a class like a discrete math or maybe even from set theory or something like that. Um, now, double, I'm going to write double slash float. They're not quite the same thing, but that detail for a basic class like this actually doesn't matter. I'm going to almost always stick to double, but in some other classes you may see the term float. They're not exactly the same but they're very, they're very similar. Um, essentially, you can think of this as a decimal number. Now, why didn't they just call it decimal? Because it's not quite a decimal number, and these very subtle differences will get you if you're not very careful. So it's like a decimal number, but as we'll see in an example in a few weeks, it's not the, exactly the same thing. But as far as we're concerned, it's so close just mentally for now, since you're just learning it, think double decimal number. So, and positive and negative decimal number. So 19.1, negative 18.3. Now let me ask this question. 2.0, would that be a double? Yes or no? 2.0, yes, right? So keep those things in mind. And a string we've actually already worked with, but we'll, we'll have ways to formally declare this a little bit later. So the string is just, think of it as a, like a blob of characters. It can be letters, numbers, printable characters, um, non-printable like spaces and tabs and stuff like that, the asterisk, underscore, all these things. Anything that's essentially a character on the keyboard. It actually doesn't have to be keyboards. You can even come up with other things, but you get the idea. So let's declare a double. And notice that it turned blue. Our syntax highlighting here helps us. It says, ah, okay, I see this special, what's called a keyword. 
Sorry. You'll just see me open that every once in a while. I want to make sure I'm not losing the stream ever. Um, now, for a variable, we declare what's called an identifier. Just like in algebra, you might de declare a variable x, but we don't do that in programming. We don't use generic names like x and y and z because it becomes a little bit confusing. We have a, we have a full keyboard. Why not make use of it? Okay. So if I'm dealing with a program that does something with your GPA, I can just declare a, a variable called GPA. And then what do I have to still add at the end of the line? What do we put at the end of every single regular line of code? Semicolon. Semicolon. Perfect. So this is how we declare a variable. We say the variable's type. In this case, the only types we're working with so far are int, double, and string. So for right now, it has to be one of those three things. And then the name of the variable that we're going to name it, GPA. Now, it should start to make a little bit of sense why we have to put quotes around things. Because if I don't have quotes around it, it sort of assumes that it's a variable. But if I put quotes around it, it says, ah, OK, I'm dealing with a string. So that, that's why we have those double quotes, is so it can tell the difference between a string and something else, okay, some other identifier or keyword. Now, in a separate stage, right now it has no value. In a separate stage, what we do, so we have variable declaration. We declare a variable, and then we assign it a value. Equals 3.7. Now, be very careful about this. What throws a lot of people off is they think back to algebra. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's not quite the same. Because in algebra, remember, you would have like a balanced equation. It's not really like that. It's more like you're taking 3.7 and you're putting it over here. So some languages, actually, what they'll do, don't type this because it's not valid code. What they'll actually do is like an arrow like this. So you get a better sense that this is actually taking this value over here and storing it over here. But Unfortunately, that's, they, didn't, they didn't choose that for C++ or C or many other languages. So, but think mentally, we're taking this value and storing it over here. And then what we can do is we can say GPA Remember when we don't put the quotes like we did before here with you remember 7 plus 2? It's going to look at this and it's going to say, ah, okay, this isn't a string because it's not in double quotes. It's just a regular piece of C++ code. And then it looks at it and it says, ah, okay, I'm going to interpret that as a variable. It's not a number. I'm looking at it and it doesn't, to me, it doesn't look like a number. So it must be a variable. And so what do you think the output of line number 13 will be? Perfect. It'll say GPA and then the colon and then 3.7. And so let's do that just to confirm. Okay. So any questions on that? And everyone's, you're, um, sometimes I go through this kind of fast, but everyone's running the code without any syntax errors, correct? Is anybody getting syntax errors? I was getting a bunch of, uh, just because it's not good just to write always correct code in class because you're not going to, you know, nobody writes correct code every single time. Let me walk you through, if you do have a syntax error, how to read these messages. Okay, so before we do that, everyone's good with this so far. You understand what's going on? Is that we declare a variable, we say, hey, there's some sort of number, in this case a, a, a double, of a variable called GPA. We're going to assign it the value 3.7, and then here we're actually going to use it. But say, for example, I did something like, forgot my semicolon. Well, A, the IDE is pretty good about giving you these messages. But the way you read these is that it'll give you the line number. So in our case, it's always going to, we're, we're dealing with just one file. It's always going to be main.cpp. But it's saying at line number 11, character 12. Character 12 is probably a little bit more detailed than you need because it's not always that exact. But line number 11. So you start looking at line number 11. If line number 11 looked perfect, then you start looking around that general area. It's not going to be, you know, 50 lines of code away usually. It's usually somewhere in that area, but it's not always exact. But in this case, it is exact. We see, uh, okay, okay, I'm looking at it now. I forgot my semicolon. Or another very common mistake was people uh, put end one instead of end L. So if I had made that mistake, let's read through that error message. And actually this one, 
it was pretty decent. It said, did you mean N and L? Okay, but if not, it would have told us on line number 13, we go over to line number 13 and it says, undeclared identifier end one. I know, it must be confused with end L, uh, or with, the, with this keyword here. It must mean end L, okay. So get good at reading those error messages because they tell you exactly what you need to fix. Don't like uh, say, oh, I've got an error somewhere and start looking at your code. Get good at reading those errors. I realize they can seem a little bit cryptic as, at first, but you get good at over time uh, decoding them. They, they have all the information you need. Okay, any questions on this? So knowing this, let's, let's work out a little program here. So we've done a bunch of like fundamentals. Let's actually start to write something that might be somewhat useful. So let's write a program, and I'll use these a lot. I like them because they're very simple. Uh, a conversion program, and it'll convert liters to gallons. So let's let's just write our boil boilerplate code first. This is example three. Again, make sure it runs because you, you know there could be an issue with REPL. You might have mistyped a, a basic piece of code. Okay, so this program is going to convert from, what do they say, um, liters to gallons. And it's a very simple conversion. I'll go to Google, and all we have to do is one liter to gallons. Essentially, we just take the number of liters times this number. And it doesn't even actually really matter if it's precise. So as a comment, I'm going to say that one liter is gallon. Close enough. So we're going to take one liter, or the number of liters, multiply it by that number. So let's start declaring some variables. So I'm going to de declare it leaders. I'm going, to, I'm going to write this a couple different ways so it's going to evolve over time. Let's start with the simple version. So I'm declaring liters, and then what I want to say is liters is equal to, let's start off, initially it's just going to be one liter. Now, very quickly, going through your head, why do you think I declared this as a double versus an integer? We, we know we're working with numbers. Why do you think I d decided a double over an int? Decimals. Yeah, somebody might plausibly want to convert one and a half liters, correct? So we have to keep that in mind. Now, you might think, why don't we, you know, we'll get into this later, but your first thought might be, okay, well, why even have integers then? Um, there's reasons. We'll get into that later. You, you might think, just declare everything as a double. It's not really necessarily that simple. And then what I can do is very easily, I can say, see out um, gallons is liters times this number, 0 0.264. I'm going to skip this over. So 
So let's say I wanted to do one and a half liters. And I always like to check back just to be sure. I'm fairly certain this code is correct, but we do 1.5, so 396, 396, perfect. But we don't, if we want to use this in multiple spots in our code, say we wanted to use the result of this in five different places, we don't want to have to do the calculation five different times. So what we can do is we can declare another variable called gallons and then we can say that gallons is equal to liters times 0 0.264. And now anytime we use it in code we don't have to do the calculation, it's just calculated once and then it's also a little bit more clear too because you're not doing some random math in there it we're just it's very clear we're saying gallons is the number of gallons everyone's good with that so let's let's take a step back and make sure you understand all of this code so this is called declaring a variable we have the data type and then what we want to call it. Don't use generic names like X and Y. Well, I, I see some students every once in a while do that. This is not algebra. We have a full keyboard, and if we're writing thousands and thousands or potentially even millions of lines of code in, the, in a large organization, it's going to get very um, difficult to follow very quickly. You know, it's like the, the languages were designed so that we can write very descriptive variable names. So that's why I write liters and gallons, because to me that it's very clear. So that's called declaration. And then from there, we can do assignment. So here we're assigning 1.5 over here. And like I said before, don't think of this like algebra, like a balanced equation. This is actually called assignment. So we're taking this and we're putting it over here. You can mentally maybe think of it as having an arrow. Even though it's not valid syntax, it, uh, it might mentally be a little bit easier. And then from here, same thing with gallons, but any valid what's called an expression, anything that can be evaluated, which this works because I'm taking liters. Well, what is liters? Liters is a double, it's a number, and actually has a very specific value, it's 1.5. So what's actually happening is when this code runs, it's actually saying 1.5 times this number. It looks at this whole thing, calculates it, gets a result and then it stores it over here. That way when we do the C out statement, it says gallons is, well by the time we get over here, we have the answer and that's why we get the correct output. Now one thing that I've seen people have trouble with the past and it may seem obvious is you, you kind of generally read this like a book, top to bottom, left to right. So I've seen people sometimes get confused that it's like, is all this code running at once without any sort of sequence or order or anything like that? It's like, how does it, how does it know that gallons is this? It's because it runs the code one at a time, top to bottom. Runs this line of code, runs this line of code. Okay, so liters now has a value of 1.5. Runs this, declares a new variable. Now it says, okay, um, gallons is gonna be equal to, and it looks over here, runs the code, and by the time we get over here, it has it. Um, to me, it sort of would seem natural because that's just how you read a book, but I've seen a lot of people get confused in the past where they just start adding pieces of code to random places. So let me do this. Um, okay, so don't change your code. This is one of those times that I'm gonna break code. Why is this wrong? And I've seen people do things like this. That's why I'm bringing up these specific examples. Is that um, so? So just tell me in your own words. You don't have to be overly technical. Why is this wrong? What's what's actually happening? Yeah. Because it's reading from top to bottom, it'll use uh, gallons for the scale code, but conversion 
Yeah, exactly. So it's, you're trying to print, but it's, it's actually, if, you, if it looks in here, you haven't assigned it a value yet. So it'll most likely just do a nonsense number, maybe zero. We'll find out in a second. Yeah, so it'll just do a nonsense number. We'll talk about that later, but um, you have to be careful of that. So the ordering does matter. It's we've declared something, but we haven't assigned it a value. So, and again, for most people, I think it may seem obvious, but I've seen this enough times where people are just adding code in a new old spot, thinking that it's going to run in some sort of random order or something like that. Just think about it, it reads like a book. Now there is an exception. It's this guy right here, the equal sign. This actually runs on the right first, but we'll talk about this later. So any question about this this uh, this program right here? Read through it. I'll I'll give you a few a few seconds just to make sure because I am we're doing pretty pretty good on time. Make sure that you understand every every single piece of it because it's one of those things that, like I said, it'll make sense, but you have to really internalize it to where it just becomes like you're not even thinking about it anymore. Um, because as we go on in you know, weeks four, five, and six, this, that's what I see is people forget the stuff from weeks one and two. Okay, everyone's good? Okay. And if for some reason your example isn't working, um, this week I'll start putting the code. Last week the stuff we did was so simple it really wasn't worth putting up. But starting this week I'll put the code examples. And as always you have the, the lectures and we haven't dropped anything yet so we're, we're good there. Okay, so let's start up a new REPL here. Start off with our hello world like always just to make sure everything's working. So we just did an example with double. I'm going to skip over int for now. It's, you know, similar enough that you can probably conceptually understand it. Let's take a look at string. Now to use strings as a variable, so normally when, it's, when we're not using a string as a variable, we can just use it. However, when we want to use it as a variable, we actually have to do something special. So just kind of, this is just one of those mental notes you have to make. Just after include IO string, we have to also include string. The reason for it is kind of, I don't want to get into it too much. It's just, it's not what's called a primitive data type. It's a more complex data type. So we have to actually bring it in its class, not, a, um, not just a primitive. It's not built into the language. So just, just kind of make a mental note. Every time you want to use a string, you can include uh, string. Now let's make a program that is kind of like our hello world, but it um, you provide the name. So that'll make sense in a second. So, so let's do this. We'll call it string and then name. So remember, this is called variable declaration. So I'll just write declare. Here I'm going to write assign.
And I think for most people, this should be pretty intuitive, going back to our GPA example. Basically the same thing, all we've done is switch out the, the data type. So what I'm going to do here is, remember, we, we could do this. We could comment out code. Programs that, um, it may not seem super obvious because we hit the play button and it runs right away. But in the real world, what you do is you compile your program and then you give it to your users. So they don't have this original source code available. What you do, and most people have probably seen this, is you have like an exe file and you run that. It'd be kind of silly if every time somebody wanted to change something in the program, um, like the name, they'd have to actually open up a code editor, change the name, and then run it. So what we can do instead is we can get it as input from somewhere. In this case, it's going to be from the user, but it could be from anywhere. It could be from, the, from a database. It could be from a file. It could be from the network. But in this case, we're just going to type it on our keyboard. Now, the way we do that is we've already seen C out. The way we're going to do that is with C in. Now, to make it a little bit more clear, usually we want to just tell the user that, you know, hey, please type something in. So let's do this. Let's just do a C out statement that says enter name. Now, notice this time I'm not going to do an end L. It'll make sense why in a minute. To take in input from the keyboard, what we do is we do CN. The arrows face the other direction. So think about it, it's like taking input from the keyboard and it's sending it over. Where is it sending it to? This variable name. Bless you. So whatever you type after you hit the enter key, it's going to be stored in this variable name. So we no longer have to hard code this. It says hello to whatever we type. So we can still type in Alice or any other name. But you don't have to change the source code. It's dynamically received the input from somewhere. In this case, our keyboard. But again, it could be anywhere. It could be a network database file, whatever. Now, a very, very, very common mistake I see is that people just get in the habit of writing these end Ls everywhere. You can't, don't do this. This doesn't really make any sense. Okay? Just kind of make a mental note. I see this a lot, is that people just get in the habit of just writing end Ls everywhere without really understanding what they mean. We're taking whatever is coming from the keyboard and we're sending it over into this variable right here. So any questions on that? Everyone, everyone gets that? CN, we take in some stuff from the keyboard and we put it over in a variable. So I didn't include an end L here. Can, somebody, can anybody tell me the effect of that? So let, let me, before I get any answers, I ran it. It says enter name. I typed in the name. Why do you think I left out that end L? Does anybody have any idea? What would happen? So let's let's run it with the end L. And it's not some super profound reason. It's it's actually just some text formatting stuff. But I just want you to be aware of these things. What happened to the cursor? From be the next line. yeah, and. I think for the most part, it sort of makes sense when you're getting user input to keep it on the same line. So it's, it's as simple as that. I just want you to be aware of these things, though, sometimes that, you know, um, sometimes I'll leave out endLs, sometimes I'll have them, sometimes I won't. Uh, don't think that every single line has to have an endL. There's nothing magical about it. It's just like a formatting thing. If, if you want to put an end line, if it makes sense at that spot, put it there. Make sure it still works. So now we have that 
new tool at our disposal to actually be able to get input from the keyboard. To me, this seems like kind of a clunky program, this lead us to gallons. And I'll let you, since we're, we're not super pressed on time, but since the example is so similar, rather than modifying this example, do this, do um, highlight everything. So control A, copy it, control C, and then let's start a new example. We'll just modify that one. There's no use from type, typing it from scratch. I don't like to modify stuff. I try to, you know, start a new example, even if it's a little bit different. Okay, so this is kind of our starting point for, is from uh, the example from before, liters to gallons. And so now what we can do is we can, rather than hard code it, like we're doing here, and by the way, you usually kind of want to group your declarations together. So I'm, there's a reason I'm grouping the code like that. So usually you, you put all your declarations at the top. And then now, instead of hard coding it in the program, what we can do is we can say, see out, enter leaders, CN, and remember the arrows are facing the other direction into liters. And then now our program is much more dynamic. Okay. Everyone understands that? Everyone's good with that? So what I want you to do, and I'll give you kind of as an in-class activity, well, no specific time, maybe between five and 10 minutes, because we're actually doing pretty good on time. I think this class gets out at three, right? It's 145 to three. Um, I might've gone a little bit faster than I needed to. Um, uh, let's do a program where you convert um, feet to inches. And we don't even have to look that one up. How many inches is one foot? 12 inches to a foot, right? So if they gave you, so they're gonna, the user is gonna give you the number of feet. And then you're gonna take that and multiply it by 12. And just to get you started, actually, um, yeah, so open up a new REPL. And what I'll do is since this is a similar example, I'll leave this up here. I'll make it a little bit smaller so you can kind of see everything. Yeah, that fits, everything fits there. And so what you're gonna be doing is feet to inches. Again, the basic idea is whatever they give you, in this case, it's the number one, but it's gonna be that number times 12. 
I know it's kind of weird that I wrote one feet. It's just to remind you that our variable name is going to be feet. Even if they only enter in one, it's going to be feet.
Okay, I'm hearing the typing slow down. Does anybody need another minute? If you, you kind of feel like if you're gonna solve it, you've already solved it. If not, you just kind of want the answer at that point. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna open up another, I already have one here waiting. I'll make this larger in a second. was example one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So what I like to think about when I'm creating these programs is, first of all, they, a lot of them follow a pattern. So if you've seen an example like this before, you should be all right. But in this case, let's say, okay, the pieces of data that I'm dealing with are going to be feet and inches. And somebody could potentially want to work with one and a half feet or 12.2 inches. So let's go ahead and make that a double. Now the first thing we do is, okay, we don't have any information so far. Let's ask the user for something. So we'll say C out, enter feet. Now we have enough information to actually do the conversion. So we'll say that inches is going to equal the number of feet that they gave us times 12. And then we'll write, um, and we'll do this in a kind of a long form here. So we'll say feet, feet is inches inches. Now just as a note, we can break this up into multiple lines and I'm gonna go ahead and do that because in this case that would make sense. And when you do that often, you want to kind of line things up where they make sense. This is one logical line of code. Remember, because every line of code ends with the semicolon. So we run from here and it says, oh, okay, I still haven't seen the semicolon yet. Let's keep on going here. And then this just makes it so that it's like you get the complete sentence. So if I want to convert one and a half feet, that should be um, 18 inches is one and a half feet is 18 inches. Is that font too small for anybody or can you still see it in the back? I guess we'll do one more example today. Um, Let's do this. What I want to do is kind of, um, sometimes what I like to do is just kind of preview where we're going in the course. And rather than, I could do another one of these conversion examples, but I think at this point, I think most people are getting it right. Um, if not, you you know go home and practice. But um, so let's do this. So take this code, do a control A, control C, and we're going to copy it into a new tab. paste it in because I want to talk about something called if statements and I'll kind of motivate it a little bit and we'll very briefly touch on it and that'll be it for the day and then I just want to um, go over how to submit assignment so you have an assignment where all you have to do is essentially take the hello world it's worth a few points but I just want to make sure everyone knows how to submit a, an assignment so that way when we have more complete uh, assignments it's uh, you don't have to worry about that part about it okay, so everyone has this copied over in a new tab. I'll wait another few seconds in case anybody's
still copying it over. So really all we've done so far is write a very fancy calculator, which is good. It's okay. It's, it's you know, worth, worth having, but what makes code sophisticated is that we can conditionally run code. We can decide to sometimes run certain code and sometimes not run it. And the easiest way and the, the most common way we do that is with what's known as an if statement. And we say if something is true, run the code. If it's not true, then it doesn't run the code. So let's, let's see why that might be useful. So right now, if I enter in two feet, everything's great. But if I enter in negative two feet, well, as far as mathematics is concerned, that's the correct answer, right? Negative two times 12, that is negative 24. But for most common usage, maybe it's, it's valid in like a physics class or something like that, but for most people, if you're just creating like a simple conversion for say an elementary school student, that's gonna be a little bit confusing. So we want to be able to, to detect if they've entered in a negative number. So the way we do that is with an if statement. And what happens is we say, if, and then some parentheses, something's true, Then we use these curly braces, and then we want to do indent so that it makes it a little bit more readable. If something is true, run this code between the curly braces. What's that something? Well, I want to know if is greater than zero. So if the inches that they entered in is greater than zero, go ahead and give me the output. So now if I enter in two, it gives me that. But if I enter in negative two, it doesn't give me anything. So let's just make sure everyone's good on that so far. I don't. We're going to do one more thing with this. It's a very minor extension, and then that'll be it. And then we'll, I'll walk you through how to submit an assignment. So this is great, right? Because it looks at it and this is either true or false. Either inches is greater than zero or not. There's only two choices. There's no like third choice. And it turns out anything that can evaluate to either true or false, you can stuff in between these parentheses. Make sure you've got your correct characters. These are curly braces. So we're saying if the stuff in between the parentheses, if inches is greater than zero, if that is true, run the code in the curly braces. Now one of the things, so we're getting a little bit further, but we don't get any output. So what we can do is we can say, we can have like a catch-all. We can say, okay, if it's greater than zero, do this. Otherwise, and the way we write that is else, and let's just say, invalid input. They give us bad input. The number of inches that they entered in, I'm sorry, the number of feet that they entered in was invalid. Now notice that we don't write else and then put parentheses. This is like the catch-all. This is saying in all other cases. That's a very common mistake I see is people put else and then they try to do some stuff with parentheses. The else is just by itself because you're saying otherwise it doesn't really make sense in English to say otherwise with some condition. You're just saying in, in all other cases. And I think that's about as much as I want to do today. I don't want to get too far ahead. But this is kind of a preview. I, I think normally I wouldn't, we wouldn't be at this point in the class, but I just gives you something to think about for next week. And more, we actually introduce this more formally next week. Okay, so this week you don't have, well, let's, um, really quick. So is everyone good typing this? 
Everyone's got this from before. And again, if you're um, missing anything, or if you're getting syntax errors or anything like that, I am going to post these in Blackboard as a zip file. So. Okay, so let's do this. Um, so your first assignment is just hello world. Very simple. It has a due date of next week. That's just in case anybody's watching from home. Really, I think everyone should be able to... We have 10 minutes left. I, I think everyone should be able to do this now. So assignment number one. All you have to do is upload a screenshot of the hello world program and the zip file. So let's, we can actually go through it as a class. So let's open up um, under, let's open up a new REPL. Let's do a hello world like you've done many times before in this class. This is just for me because I've, what I've seen in the past is people kind of go through class and they don't really, they're not actually typing the code or going through or anything like that. And then they get to the exam and, or you know the first assignment, they haven't really been following along and it's like week three or four. This is just to kind of ensure everyone has been at least typing along, running the code and so forth. So let's just do a um, quick hello world. Once you're sure that's running, make sure it actually works. So the first thing I want to see is a screenshot because I've had people in the past where they just write the code and they never actually execute it, which is don't get in the habit. I've seen that a lot of times where people write out full whole assignments and turn them in without even ever having tested or run the code or anything like that. Probably the easiest way is, um, I think there's a new, new tool in Windows now, but I think just um, the snipping tool, that's kind of my go-to. And you can do the whole screen or you can just do just like a region. Either is good enough for me. Just enough to show me that you've run the program. I see this, I say, okay, they know how to run the program. So again, you go to the, in Windows and in Mac, it's a little bit different. You can Google it. I can, I can help um, people after class if you need. Snipping tool, open it up, grab a region of the screen where it kind of just shows your source code and that you actually ran it. Then you can go to file, save, put it wherever, your desktop if you want to. Desktop's fine. But you're going to need two things. You're going to need the screenshot, but normally in the assignments, I don't really care about the screenshot because I need to run it myself. I need the actual source code. So if you go over here, you should see, and I'm going to make the fonts a little bit smaller because it's kind of wants to hide it. But everyone should see over here. If you don't see it, you click this files button, okay, to make sure it's not hidden. And then click these three dots, and then you can download a zip. And then that should end up in your downloads. So at this point, you should have a screenshot plus the actual zipped source code. And it gives it just three random words. And if I click this, I should see right here, okay, it's got main.cpp, perfect. You don't need to extract it or anything. I, I, I do that step for you because I've noticed that people get confused about how to extract it. Um, and then you'll go over to assignments and then you'll need to, so click the assignment. You'll need to upload two files. You'll go to browse. The first is that screenshot. Then you'll also need, and again, it gives it three, just you can go by the date. So right here, 
zip file and then click submit and then you can check it afterwards if after I can't submit it because I'm not a you know a, a student user but afterwards if you go to the assignments and you click the assignment it should show that two files have been submitted okay okay so I think that's pretty much it for today if anybody needs help submitting um, hang out for a few minutes after class. We actually have five minutes for that, so that that'll be just enough time. Any question on anything as far as course material goes or anything like that? If for whatever reason you fell behind during class, this is recorded, and it looks like we didn't really drop a couple frames, not many, but um, you can always watch that. And then if you're just having like a syntax error that you just can't see what's going wrong, I always. Um, all those examples that we did today, I'll upload those into an area called class examples. I haven't enabled it yet, but I'll upload that, okay? So if you're all done with that, um, keep a lookout for announcements, but um, that's it for today. So stay safe and I'll see you next week. And if there's anybody who needs a little bit of extra help just getting that uploaded, stick around for a few minutes and I can help you, okay?